Hello and welcome to Podcast Bridging Voices, the online discussion forum of the multinational development policy dialogue of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation in Brussels. My name is Louis Mourier, Program Manager for Climate Policy at the Foundation, and today we're discussing the EU's climate security nexus and its climate adaptation strategies in the Sahel. Just a few weeks ago, we launched a new policy report on how climate interrelates with conflict in the Sahel. And actually, we had quite different findings compared to the dominant climate security narrative, which sees climate as a direct driver of violence and which is very prominent in European policy circles. So today we'd like to have a look back to the key results of the report and discuss what the report means for the EU's climate adaptation policies and its development cooperation in the Sahel. And for that, I'm very happy that the author of the report, Delina Gokcho, is on board today. Um, hi, Delina, how are you doing? Hi, Louis, it's lovely to be here. Um, but Delina, we are not alone, actually. Uh, we have two fantastic speakers um, who work extensively on the Sahel region. Um, can you tell our listeners who are our guests today? Uh, here today with us, we have Sophie Desmet, who is Policy Officer at the Security and Resilience Programme within the European Centre for Development Policy Management, ECDPM, in the Netherlands, and Chitra Nagarajan, a journalist and writer who works on climate change, conflict, gender issues, foreign policy, migration, mostly from Nigeria and the wider Lake Chad region. Great. Also, a warm welcome from my side to Sophie and Chitra. Very much looking forward to our discussion today. Um, but Delina, let me get first to you. Um, in the framework of our work on the Sahel, back in September last year, we decided to conduct an assessment of European approaches to climate and security in the region. And initially, our idea was to treat climate change and desertification as yet another threat for security um, in the Sahel. But then interviews with a set of experts, both in Europe and West Africa, painted, let's say, a rather different picture. And um, we realized, I think, that the link between climate change and insecurity in the Sahel is less obvious than one might assume on first glance. So could you give us a brief overview on the key results of your report? And why are your findings so surprising? Thank you, Louis. Yes, when we first started working uh, working on this, the, the what we thought we would see was rather different from what we then ended up witnessing. And especially from conversations with scholars, we realized that we had misinterpreted uh, this link between climate change and security. Um, in the Sahel specifically, and I think it makes sense to mention this over and over again, our research focused on West Africa and uh, the Sahel more specifically. Um, and in this framework, work uh, just on April 19th, the European Union published its new Sahel strategy in the form of European Council conclusions, which does mention very briefly climate as well. So it is true, uh, this is something that we witnessed um, over and over again, that susceptibility to multi-dimensional risks is something that is particularly evident in the Sahel. The region we know is facing a dramatic increase in violence, which is perpetrated by armed groups since at least 2012. This, of course, tends to overwhelm already fragile and, um, as we see in this report, predatory institutions, and it fuels violence, migration and displacement. Now, this is on the violence side of things, but on the other hand, uh, temperatures in the region are also rising 1.5 times faster than the global average. And at the same time, records show an increase in precipitation, which of course affects livelihoods. And in the Sahel, this is particularly clear in rural areas. I would say it is no wonder that European policy observers have seen climate change induced droughts as a direct driver of violence, uh, as a phenomenon leading to, to radicalization or to pitting farmers and herders against one another for the control of land. We also saw that it is more complex than that. A 2012 analysis in the Journal of Peace Research, which focuses on uh, land use disputes in the Mopti region in Mali, is a, is a specific region in the center of Mali, um, this report shows no correlation between climate and conflict, which is to, to our, in our opinion, particularly interesting. 
So both in times of drought and precipitation, the report shows that communities presented the same level of satisfaction and dissatisfaction with one another. This is backed up by more recent research, also by the EU Institute for Security Studies. But aside from this, there is also more. So we conducted also a series of interviews throughout 2020 with experts in the region and in Europe uh, throughout uh, this uh, Konrad Adenauer project. And we saw that the theory of the paradox of plenty shows that scarcity of resources cannot directly be linked to conflict. The opposite, uh, and this is what surprised us, uh, surprised us the most, uh, the opposite is in fact true. More conflicts take place in times of relative abundance of resources because competition for land intensifies. The International Crisis Group um, argues that what directly leads to disputes is not climate change nor desertification, which is the constant rhetoric um, within the European Union on what is happening in the Sahel, but rather a lack of proper regulation over resources that are increasingly sought after. So, and this is... This is why um, our finding is particularly, I think, illuminating for EU policymakers. Wherever EU and member states provide development aid to contrast specifically the effects of climate change, they should do so bearing in mind that the, these projects could end up producing the opposite effect. They could end up increasing the value of a certain area, which then would lead to an increase in disputes. And I'm looking forward to talking about solutions. Great. Thank you so much, Lina. And what I really like about your paper is that it basically challenges some key assumptions that we take for granted. Um, but actually it's very important to question sometimes those assumptions because especially in a complex region like the Sahel, we need to make sure that we have a nuanced approach, a context specific approach to security and instability. And with that, let me get to you, Sophie and Chitra, because as I said, it's good to have a fresh perspective on the topic. But still, Delina's findings are quite controversial, without any doubt. Many, many organizations see, see, this, see the problem completely different, um, including the European Exxon Action Service, some leading think tanks, and even some Sahelian governments themselves. Um, so what's your reaction on the report and on Delina's findings? Do you agree with her? Or do you see it differently? Chitra, uh, you, you work ex extensively on the region. Uh, why don't you start? Thank you. And thank you very much, Delina, for presenting that. I think just listening to what you said and looking at climate security in the Sahel, I'm struck by how much we don't know um, and the lack of grounded evidence versus this narrative about a, almost a causal link between climate change and security, which many actors um, talk about. Um, we do need to be context specific um, and look at specific countries and even within countries, particular regions, because obviously the impacts of climate change and the impacts of conflict differ. It is undeniable that climate change is affecting people's lives in the Sahel, as is insecurity. But the link between the two is a bit unclear and requires further investigation. And I did a, um, a briefing paper for the Climate Security Expert Network last year on Mali, and most conflict analysts that I spoke to were unsure. Saying that, however, uh, what my paper found was that there has been significant climatic variability in Mali, that this changes according to the area of the country that you're in. Um, and although it's difficult to show a direct link between climate change and conflict, and actually most people working in climate security don't actually talk about a direct causal link, we do have some ways that climate change and conflict are interacting. Um, for example, in the context of Mali, we find that rent seeking and corrupt behavior um, from government, from local leaders, negatively impact both environmental and conflict dynamics. Um, so it means that the, um, the, the issues that people are experiencing, both when it comes to climate change and conflict, are less possible to resolve. We did see also some instances of how environmental and climate action that's done in conflict insensitive and predatory ways can increase grievances. And a really good example of this is the Forest Service in Mali, which was established to fight desertification, um, which you know is one of the international priorities. 
but unfortunately, over the decades, has become one of the key agencies engaging in extortion, fining people, imprisoning people, connect, collecting firewood or grazing their livestock. Um, and this anger that civilians feel has been mobilized and acted on by armed opposition groups in their attempts to recruit local populations. We also see significant migration as a result of climate change which has been a way of life for many communities across Mali and has been a way that people in Mali are resilient to the changes of both climate change and the changes when it comes to conflict. However, whereas we used to see seasonal migration in the past because of climate change and because their lands are no longer as viable from a life, livelihoods perspective as before, we're seeing more permanent and southward migration. And there was a really interesting paper written by International Alert last year, which speaks about how we're potentially seeing more conflict um, over, over land and water resources in Southern Mali as a, as a corollary of this migration. The, the impact between climate change and natural resource conflict, we don't know. I mean, we have seen some indications of increasing natural resource-based conflicts in central and southern Mali, uh, which may be as a result of climate change. But as I said, there's more investigation that needs to, needs to be done there. So, I mean, let me just finish by saying that climate change and conflict are impacting people's lives. Um, the link between them in the context of the Sahel is unclear at present. We need a lot more research and evidence on this, but also that climate insecurity in the Sahel is not inevitable. And there's a strong role that policy and programming can play either to drive climate insecurity or to address and mitigate its possibility. Thank you, Chitra, for clarifying um, and explaining more on the cumulative effects. What do you think, Sophie? Yes, thank you also from my side for, for inviting me to this uh, fascinating and very necessary uh, conversation today. today. I think uh, your report, Delinea, and also the work of Chitra are really necessary elements to, to try to demystify the link between uh, conflict and climate change. And we can also see this uh, almost harmful narrative in, in, in other uh, examples, for example, the role of, of armed and violent extremist groups in the region and their activities only leading to more conflicts, whereas in some cases, actually, these actors have also mediated conflicts. Uh, but perhaps these are the types of inconvenient truths that uh, policymakers and also researchers need to work through before coming to a better understanding of the evidence and also the solutions. And I think climate change and its effects and the responses to it also should be seen in a context of of wider and, and quite long-term socioeconomic developments. Uh, for example, in the region, we see this in the changes that have happened to the political economy of agro-pastoralism and uh, the long-standing marginalization of certain pastoralist communities and their exclusion from uh, decision-making uh, mechanisms, but also other uh, inequalities linked to, for example, rural urban disparities or the pressures of uh, migration that Chitra just, uh, just mentioned. And I think conflicts between communities, of course, over resources, they're not new. And it's true that these conflicts have become more violent in certain instances because of the regional conflict dynamics where spilling across borders have also made them more complex. But au fond, these processes are really informed by longstanding social economic grievances and challenges. And I think they should be seen as the, as the primary issues uh, to tackle. Uh, we see this, for example, in um, Burkina Faso, where uh, research has shown that dispute me mechanisms used to, used to be able to resolve conflicts between communities over arable land, but also pastoralist routes. But more and more, uh, there was a critique on this system that was a result of a locked-in uh, power system that really excluded pastoralist communities from having a say on how those resources were, uh, were developed or were divided between communities. And in a context of growing conflicts, of course, this has been uh, handily um, abused by uh, groups that wanted to um, form a response to that, to that social critique. But it's not uh, evidence to uh, climate change having a direct impact uh, on conflict. It's really a symptom of deeper socioeconomic inequalities. Perfect. Thank you so much, Chitra and Sophie, for these very important statements. 
Um, and Chitra, you mentioned a very interesting aspect. You said that climate insecurity is not inevitable in the Sahel if programming, if development cooperation um, is done right. So let's talk a bit about what the EU is actually doing with regard to the climate security nexus um, in the Sahel and in the region. Um, and Sophie, let me get to you for that issue, because I think we have now heard, we have now established that we are quite critical of engaging with the climate issue in the Sahel through a security lens. And yet in its new climate adaptation strategy, um, the EU makes up a clear connection between climate adaptation and ensuring security. So it seems that climate adaptation um, is taking center stage in the EU's climate security approach um, in the Sahel, including through mega projects such as the Great Green Wall, where the EU um, is funding a large part of. But the question is, is that the right focus? What can we realistically expect of climate adaptation measures when it comes to security? And shouldn't we be more skeptical of climate adaptation as a security tool um, with regard to the finding of Delina's report? What's your view on that? Well, maybe first um, a word on the Great Green Wall Initiative, uh, which is, uh, as we know, a UN initiative that has recently gotten some renewed attention. Also, it's seen as one of the African Union's uh, flagship projects. And, and so on paper has gotten some, uh, some regional buy-in and ownership. And also recently uh, in January, uh, the United States committed quite some uh, funds uh, to this initiative, some $14 billion. Um, but of course, the implementation of it is quite complex. And uh, I think only some 15% of the total funding has been implemented or dispersed. Uh, and it covers a wide range of conflicts, uh, countries uh, that are also affected by conflict, also, which also complicates uh, the implementation of the Great Green Wall Initiative, which also touches on fisheries and such. So in, on the one hand, it's a positive sign that partners are supporting a project that is also that has some ownership on the continent. But uh, these flagship projects cannot be, I mean, the responses need to be a, li a little bit more fine grained and fine tuned and the, implement the complexity of it uh, will be in the implementation. I think we can be uh, also based on, on your reports and your work, be skeptical, be skeptical about what to really expect on this uh, in growing focus on the uh, on climate and, and particularly climate adaptation. Um, as you know, the new EU budget for 2021-2027 uh, uh, has committed to spend some 25% of its spending across all programs on climate change. And this was confirmed uh, by the EU uh, Green Deal. Uh, we know that external aid programs are not the biggest chunk of the EU's budget, although still uh, considerable. Um, but uh, there will be challenges and questions on how the EU can live up to this uh, spending target. It's, it's positive that there is a spending tar target on climate change, but the system uh, to track the, the financial spending on climate change is really not robust enough at this moment to find out how this is really contributing to climate change uh, objectives. And within that spending on climate change, there is still a mismatch between spending on climate mitigation uh, and climate adaptation, with adaptation still way behind. And I mean, there have been some improvements, but you could still see the climate uh, adaptation funding as a, as a spending orphan. Uh, also, in addition to gaps between uh, climate uh, uh, commitments to climate uh, adaptation, and then the actual disbursements, where we also see still uh, some gaps. Just one follow up question on that, uh, because you mentioned the gap between mitigation and adaptation, which I think is really important. So let's assume that uh, we increase our engagement on climate adaptation. Can we say that climate adaptation will be some kind of security policy tool for the EU in the Sahel? Is that really what it should be? No, I don't think climate adaptation should be securitized, if that's what you're saying. But I think there is, and I think that's also, if I understood correctly from Delina's report, there is a lot of scope to uh, design climate adaptation strategies in a more conflict sensitive and politically savvy way. Whereas now they are being designed perhaps more from a, from a technical uh, point of view. There will also be big questions about policy coherence because the EU Green Deal is supposed to inform all of the EU's uh, uh, instruments and funding, you know, from trade to foreign policy to humanitarian aid. 
and how to get all of these instruments on the same line and informed by the same kind of evidence, which is already kind of difficult to find and needs to be very fine grained, like Chitra said, is very context and region specific. That will be quite a challenge for the EU. We will expand more on this, Sophie, thank you, um, especially on the on the changing priorities for the EU and this whole switching of buzzwords and volatility of aid in the next question. But I just wanted to very quickly zoom in now um, and perhaps um, ask Chitra more on what is currently taking place in the Lake Chad area with regard to the effects of climate change um, in relation, of course, to the behavior of local governments there. Um, could you expand, Chitra, on whether climate change is a big topic or whether problems actually go deeper, or probably both? So I've done um, quite a bit of research looking at climate security in the Lake Chad area with Adelphi, and our Shoring Up Stability report really found that climate change was gravely impacting the lives of people of the region and had been for decades. You know, I think in Europe, people think that climate change is something for the future, um, but in many parts of the world, including in the Lake Chad region, it's something that people have seen already in their lives. And so the people who I spoke to talked about how the rain was much more unpredictable than it had been when they were younger. They talked about increasing temperatures and the impact of both on their livelihoods. However, prior to the conflict, people were able to adapt to the changes in climate. Um, however, this adaptability and resilience has been blocked due to the conflict. And the, the interaction between climate change and insecurity has really impacted people's resilience to climate change, uh, impacted their livelihoods and also affected social cohesion. Let me give a quick example here. So a couple of years ago, I spoke to a male farmer who told me about the impact that climate change had on his lives. And this has been going on for years. But he said in the past, he was able to diversify his crops, um, to kind of guard against the changes in the rains, um, was able to go into fishing. And usually when the rains, um, the rains were less, the, the fishing would be better when the rains were more, the farming would be better. And so therefore, you know, he kind of hedged his bets. Um, and even though life was difficult because of climate change, but this diversification meant that not all his livelihood strategies would fail in any given year. However, because of the conflict, he's now an IDP, um, not having access to farming lands, let alone the waters of Lake Chad, and all his ability to um, kind of strategize and make changes to provide for himself and his family had completely collapsed because of a combination of climate change and conflict. At the same time, we're seeing increasing natural resource conflicts. And of course, climate change is not the only factor there, but it has played a, a role in making livelihoods more difficult and kind of increasing the stakes of what people have to lose. And at the same time, there is this widespread narrative around how economic difficulties has contributed. It's not the only factor, but it is a factor when it comes to recruitment into armed opposition groups. Um, so yes, I would say that climate change, insecurity, climate security has a big impact in the Lake Chad region. However, unfortunately, the governments of the region are not integrating climate security into policymaking as thoroughly as they should. The Lake Chad Basin Commission has a good strategy, but when it comes to the national governments, um, they're not really basing their policies on a contextual understanding of, um, of the region. And rather, for example, government action is hindering and blocking adaptation. So for example, military restrictions um, do not allow people to fish or farm in certain places. And this really makes lives very difficult for people. At the same time, the Nigerian government is urging a water transfer project so the idea is to transfer water from the Congo River Basin into the Lake Chad Basin. Um, now, there's 
a lot of problems with this idea, not least that people have been adapting to changes in the Lake Chad for centuries. And actually, when I spoke to people, not a single person, I interviewed 250 people um, for the study, and not a single person told me that changes in the levels of the lake was their number one problem with climate change. The number one problem was rainfall unpredictability. Um, and so I think this really underlines the, the need for like proper contextual understanding that is based on discussions with people who have who are worst affected by climate change, conflict, and the interaction between the two, um, rather than aiming for quick fixes, which look good and you know, try and sell the idea that you're taking action to address climate change. Perfect. Thank you so much, Chitra. Uh, it's really always good to have a perspective from the ground, actually. Um, and, I, and I think you mentioned one particularly interesting point that I want to pick up here. Um, you said that government action um, in the region is blocking adaptation. And let's talk a bit about how EU Development Corporation is contributing to that issue. Um, and that, re that refers to a certain issue that Delina already mentioned, um, because one key point that is mentioned in our policy report is the problem of volatility of aid. So that with the new focus on climate, we basically risk shifting our priorities from one topic to another, from a violent extremism a few years ago, over migration after 2015, to climate change, which is now the key topic for domestic politics um, in Europe. And Sophie, I wanted to ask you, um, is this something that you have also observed in your work in the Sahel or even in other regions? And Chitra, second question to you. To what extent is this volatility of aid a problem for Sahelian governments? And what do they expect from donors such as the EU? Well, I think it's uh, I mean, fair enough to say that uh, um, strategies, uh, EU strategies and approaches in the Sahel have been heavily informed by uh, political and maybe even domestic priorities, EU uh, priorities. And so uh, we have seen a Sahel strategy that has been heavily uh, focused on, on stabilization and security and countering violent extremism. Uh, although making linkages between violent extremism and the need for youth employment, but from the perspective mostly of stabilizing the region, avoiding too much migration to the EU, to be very blunt. I'm not sure if uh, volatility is a word that I would use with climate change uh, funding at the moment, simply because I don't think the spending is very high at the moment. And uh, like I was saying before, uh, there is a bias towards uh, climate mitigation. And I think there's a lot of room for improvement, improvement to spend more on climate adaptation, which is also uh, um, should be a, accompanied by a longer term engagement, because of course it talks about strengthening long term resilience of communities to negative effects of climate change. And in some cases, conflict, although as Chitra said, they are they can be quite uh, different. So I think if you if we will look at the implementation of the new EU Sahel strategy, uh, we will have to look at uh, what is actually being done and how much will actually be spent on the different uh, priorities that will be um, contained uh, in that strategy. If you look at the spending now, uh, the figures just clearly show that the focus is on security stabilization and not so much on education and social services uh, or climate change. And, and so the, the 25% uh, spending target for the EU over the next uh, six to seven years in the Green Deal is good. But uh, as said, it will be really a case of monitoring how this funding will be will actually be spent and, and also to whom. I mean, if you look at the 20 countries uh, most affected by climate change in Africa, uh, many of them in the Sahel, they, they are not part of the list of the 20 countries that receive most uh, climate adaptation funding. And a recent report by the European Court of Auditors confirmed also uh, this um, uh, neglect of poorer countries. Uh, and other reports have also, for example, found that the, the spending on climate adaptation funding for Turkey was the same amount as uh, as, as all uh, developing countries in the, in the EU's uh, budget. There are some gaps there that, that will need to be filled before we can talk about those massive budgets having negative effects if they would be shifted from one uh, region uh, or one uh, spending priority to another. Uh, I think it's a case of increasing climate adaptation funding for 
first, and also then designing policies that are evidence-based, politically and conflict sensitive, and supported by adequate monitoring on how that spending is done and implemented. Yeah, thank you very much for those reflections, Sophie. I mean, I've worked on several, you know, long-term multi-year development and peace building projects, um, not in the Sahel, but in northeast, north, northeast and northern Nigeria. And I found a number of times, you know, these projects have really good results. They need to um, continue to build on and ensure sustainability and really kind of achieve impact. But they're not extended or renewed because of changing politics and priorities. Um, and Sophie talked about, you know, this, this political impetus to prevent migration into Europe um, and how that seems to be driving development policy. And it's very clear this is playing to domestic constituencies, not the well-being of people. When I did our climate security um, assessment in Lake Chad, I heard so many times from donors, okay, so is climate security, do you see a link between that and migration into Europe? And there is no link, but you find kind of donor priorities that are not relevant to the realities on the ground, influencing what gets funded. And so there's been a number of cases where people have to kind of shift their project or reframe their project to kind of hit the hot buzzwords at the time. Um, so for example, transforming a good governance project into a countering violent extremism project, even if there isn't actually that much violent extremism in the areas where they're implementing just to get money. And I do think that this chopping and changing of donor priorities is a real problem, not just in West Africa, but globally. I 100% agree with you. Then it contributes to not just the way the project is imagined and implemented, but also on the measurement of it. How can you measure something that starts as a project focusing on countering violent extremism and then turns into something more focused on migration? I mean, is it just makes programming and then and then good programming, subsequent programming, very problematic. I, I would now like to focus on the solution side of things uh, very quickly. Sophie mentioned some recommendations earlier. And um, it is obvious that we believe that you should operate a shift in the way it perceives the nexus between climate conflict and West Africa. But climate, of course, should be a priority nonetheless. Uh, what should the EU's climate policy in the Sahel focus on? And uh, I, I would assume Chitra could, uh, could address this question from, from a more regional perspective and Sophie from uh, a Dutch-based northern, northern European one, maybe going to go back to something that was mentioned earlier about how all of this is very context specific and I would really urge just building in resources um, and expertise for integrated analysis that brings in climate change, conflict, gender, social inclusion, uh, political economy on, on which you base your programming. So I mean, this is very um, obvious, but really starting from a thorough analysis of what is actually happening on the ground. Because even when you talk about climate security, and I go back to Mali here, the, the, the dynamics are very different in different parts of Mali. So you have, you know, you have the arid Sahara, the semi-arid uh, Sahel, the, the delta of the Niger River, um, and then the humid savannas. And climate security takes very different shapes in each of those areas and yet we're assuming uh, we're talking about climate security in the Sahel, which is a huge region um, whereas actually we should be talking at more at the country and even the sub national levels um, so that would be my first point and then the second is really looking at governance and looking at the importance of building the inclusiveness, the accountability, the responsiveness of state institutions, because these really are um, key conflict drivers. And not only is, is building and improving state institutions going to mitigate conflict, but it also means that if it's done for properly, that these institutions then can help populations adapt to the changes in climate that they're seeing. And on this point, I need to be very clear that I'm not talking about capacity building here in a unidirectional way. 
uh, climate security is a new topic for all of us and everybody in the world is learning about this. So I don't want it to seem that, you know, people from Europe are going to go and help the governments in the Sahel. Rather, it should be a way that we can all learn together about what is happening and when it comes to climate security and then also what the solutions are. And then finally, I will talk about, because we haven't actually mentioned it that much on this podcast, um, about gender and other inequalities and the real risk that people who are socially excluded, marginalized, including women and girls, but also young men, uh, people with disabilities and those from certain ethnic and religious backgrounds will remain trapped in a cycle of vulnerability to climate change conflict and the intersection of the two. Um, because we know that people with more wealth and resources are better able to adapt to changing environments and to deal with external shocks. So we really need to make sure that people who are already most marginalized and socially excluded are supported to deal with the changes. And our policies and programs are gender transformatory in nature, um, because otherwise we're not really working for the benefit of the populations. Yes, and if I can just connect to what uh, Chitra just mentioned, I think that's incredibly important and it points to one of the challenges that the EU will have in ensuring policy coherence between all of its instruments. We know that the EU has now adopted a new gender action plan and how will that resonate with its uh, climate adaptation uh, uh, objectives and how will we measure those, as uh, Delina said uh, earlier. So I think, I mean, there's no climate policy policy for the Sahel specifically, and maybe in and of itself that's already an issue, but as Chitra also says, it's so locally defined and uh, the, the way it, pl it plays out is so context specific that I think uh, an important uh, element in defining a more fine-grained understanding of climate change effects in a certain country or locality uh, will need to be supported uh, by, for example, EU delegations in the region. And uh, we all know that they have a very heavy workload in terms of programming and context analysis. And uh, there must be ways to support also them in uh, being able to gather uh, the necessary evidence and also work with partners uh, because there is a lot of uh, evidence and scientific research in the region that could also inform the EU's policy uh, design and, and also its implementation. We know, for example, that the EU has also asked its delegations to conduct conflict and uh, context analysis as part of its EU programming. So that's also an opportunity for the EU to continuously engage with new evidence, new partnerships and new information on how climate change affects the region in which they are trying to implement their uh, projects and programs as best as possible. And as the report by Delina says, this, this should be politically informed, not just technical. Um, I don't think we should be naive about how sensitive this can be when engaging with national governments on uh, climate change adaptation and spending of budgets with national governments. There as well, there are power dynamics at play. So um, it will be a difficult exercise, but it is a conversation to be had because also Sahelian governments should not hide between climate change to avoid having discussions about responsibilities and accountability uh, for um, inequalities or lack of economic growth or insecurity in their country. So it will be a difficult task for the EU if it's ready to, uh, to take it up um, in its commitment to work more on climate change in the Sahel specifically. Perfect, thank you so much to both of you. Really, really interesting points and very important input from both of you. Um, unfortunately, we slowly have to come to an end, even though I think that in this podcast we have addressed some really good food for thought for both Sahelian actors and European policymakers. But Delina, since it's your report, um, I wanted to ask you, do you have any final remarks, any final comments um, based on what Chitra and Sophie um, just told us? Aside from the fact that I really enjoyed doing this and I kept imagining that we were all sitting at a round table and drinking tea. Just one quick thing on the fact that this new EU Sahel strategy has just been published. I think the work of all of us and very many other people is now necessary to make sure that a lot of the things that we discussed today will be taken into consideration specifically with, uh, with regard to the conflict sensitive approach that Sophie, for example, mentioned. I think 
is is just necessary at this point to unpack the strategy and see how it can be implemented in a way that accounts for for everything that we discussed and everything that is being published and is being discussed in the region as well. So I hope this could be done in the best way possible. So then um, let's take this post podcast um, as an opportunity to all of our listeners, as a call for engagement to our listeners on the Zahal strategy. I fully agree. It's definitely necessary to keep a close eye on what it will entail for the future of the EU's engagement, both militarily, but also when it comes to um, development cooperation in the region. So unfortunately, that's it for today. Thank you very, very much to Chitra, Sophie and Lina for some really interesting points and comments. Um, thank you also to all of our listeners uh, and that you joined us today. We will be back very soon with a new fresh discussion, bridging the gap between the EU and the global south. In the meantime, we invite you to follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter and Facebook. You can find all the necessary links in the description and we look forward to the next discussion. Until then, stay safe and goodbye.